Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Welcome to this special Shabbat, which is um, because obviously this is the Shabbat before uh, Pesach, Passover, and, uh, and it's a first for me to sit like this, but uh, it has been a testing week one way or another, and um, I just feel a need to, to just sit rather than stand today, if that's okay with you. And if you can see Michael when he's sat in his rocking chair, you're, you can see me on the <laughs> stool. <laughs> We've nicknamed him Jackanory. <laughs> uh, okay, I can see my words better, actually, from this level as well. <laughs> Ah, oh dear. Well, it's, it's a time of joy, isn't it? And that was a, a real time of joyous worship. It's great. And today I'm going to, to speak uh, about basically the, uh, the issue or the story, the event, the scriptural basis and the, uh, the time of Passover. And uh, it's my joy to be able to do so. Um, I... Uh, many times spent time thinking about this time of year, uh, as I'm sure you have, and I find that there is, it's a rich source of revelation. Um, I'm going to be looking at scriptural records, obviously, of this time, and uh, I want to enter into the reality for us of what Passover means. Um, both as, as a congregation and individually, because we're all different. I love this about God. We're all so different. We're all unique. Not one of us is the same as another. And that's, I think God loves that, that, that variety. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made us like that, would he? He would have made us all automatons or robots. We'd all be like Mike Fryer, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> 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 God, Margaret said, God forbid. <laughs> and she's an elder. She's an elder. <laughs> but, you know, there are, there are several feasts of God, aren't there? And you know what? There are many mysteries to be revealed. And uh, we're going to look at this particular one. In particular, with Passover, the currents run so, uh, so old, so ancient, the currents of it, so deep, and it's unlikely, I think, that we'll ever be able to fully plumb their depth or the, uh, you know, the, to plumb the, the, the fullness of it, this side of eternity. The, the, the thing that encourages me is that when we get to heaven, we're going to know it all, aren't we? It's going to be wonderful. We're not going to have all these questions that we have, but I'm going to do my best anyway to share it. If I don't get on with it, we'll never get through it. So <laughs> okay, I want to say that each time that we apply our hearts and minds to discover something of the Lord, we understand more, don't we? We learn more, we enter more fully into the enormity of him, the being who is the God we serve, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and we draw nearer to him. We fall deeper in love with him, and we're uh, more thankful to him for what he has done, because as the, each veil is, is, is lifted, we see him more clearly, don't we? I, I came to Yeshua 40 years ago as a Gentile agnostic. And uh, fortunately for me, I received salvation um, by myself, sitting in church, just God and me, having read a book and having prayed a prayer, but nothing had happened. But when I came to church and when I came and sat in a congregation that worshipped in spirit and in truth, that's, that was the moment that I met with God. And um, it was a, a renewed, spirit-filled Anglican church. And it was wonderful. And I loved it. I loved Easter. <laughs> because I, I discovered, no, no, you know what? I discovered that that was the time the church taught that Jesus died. And I loved it. And I got up, I was, I'm a late riser, but I got up early on an Easter morning to watch the sunrise and worship God. 
Now, I wouldn't do that now because I've gone deeper with God. I've come to understand that Easter is not what it's about. But, but Easter, you know, it, so many people do. But Passover is when Yeshua died. It was the feast of Passover, not Easter. So I'm saying that because we all come on a journey and we don't want to despise those who are still on that journey. So having read that Passover is a Jewish feast that Yeshua called the disciples to prepare for when the upper room was found and they all shared a meal together, it wasn't until I connected the Old Testament scriptures, the Tanakh, with the Torah and the prophets, all the word of God right from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament, as, it's, as people call it, and together with the disciples and the apostles and all that was said about them with Yeshua's words, that a glimmer of understanding began to come into me. And as I started to make that eternal connection to see the chords of history weaving in and through the two stories of Passover, because there's two stories to Passover, so many years apart and yet so it eternally entwined together, that I began to get revelation with. Those tapestry threads gave me the understanding that they are more than stories. The understanding that Passover is not just a Jewish feast. It's one of God's ordained, eternal celebrations that is for me and for you as much as for anyone in the world to partake of. We're all invited to take part in Passover. And I'm so looking forward to this next 10-day period when we celebrate the start of Pesach, the Jewish name for Passover, with our meal together on Monday night. Really looking forward to that. Please, will somebody remind me to take the meat out of the freezer? <laughs> uh, seriously, I've just remembered. I've just remembered, and if I don't, we won't have a meal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Monday evening signifies the, the, the evening before the first day, or the first day of Passover. And we celebrate our meal always on the first day of Passover, and I'm looking forward to it. And then we go through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is seven days. And then we go into First Fruits, the Resurrection, which Becky will be speaking about next Shabbat. <laughs> looking forward to that too. Okay, scripture, well, scripture, the word of God is both a faithful and true record of historical facts and events, isn't it? I think we can all say amen to that. Whilst at the same time being a mysterious, glorious foreshadowing of the future things to come. It's a living, breathing word. You know, we all know that but when we look in it, we see something new. We've read it a thousand times or a hundred times or even twice, but we st see something new every time we read scripture. I'm only on done page one. <laughs> oh it doesn't board well. Anyway, it does. Let us try as believers to understand that those events, those scripture, that, that scripture describes are so much more than just a passing anecdote or a story to be told then forgotten or a glancing reference to something so long in the past, long forgotten and no longer relevant. Rather, they foreshadow the future, which for us can be today. Because I don't know about you, but when I was first saved, I read things that have now been fulfilled in my life. They, they, those things that I read, which were an encouragement, maybe 10 years, 12 years, 20 years down the line, were fulfilled. So it's a living, breathing thing for us. And we can be sure of one thing, that God does not change. A couple of scriptures just to endorse that. Tw Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Don't we all change our mind? Don't we all go back on our words sometimes? I, tr I must admit, I try not to. But it's really hard sometimes when you've made a wrong decision, isn't it? 
and you've promised something. Psalm 55, verse 19. God, who is enthroned from of old, who does not change. Hallelujah. And Hebrews 13, verse 8. Yeshua Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, isn't it comforting that they know the word? <laughs> So let's, we're going to be looking at Exodus. We're going to be following this scripture, this, this story in Exodus. So we'll go first of all to, to Exodus chapter 3, if you'd just like to look at that. Because I'm going to be talking a little bit about Moses, who was a key player in the story of the first Passover. Uh, the most humble man around the, at the time, um, he tells us. It always amuses me that he wrote the book the, in which he said he was the most humble man. <laughs> and, but he was commissioned, wasn't he? He had a commission from God to bring God's people out of Egypt, out of slavery and out of oppression and out of darkness into light, out of nothing into plenty. And you can go home and you can read chapters 3 to 10, in Exodus, which describe this voluble but familiar event that uh, I, I'm going to pray see uh, uh, as I go along. But to in, in order to achieve this, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, didn't he? He was the king holding on to Israel. He didn't want to let them go. He wanted to use them and continually have them as slaves so that God could demonstrate his power and his glory through 10 miracles. Exodus 3, verse 19. God said to Moses, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. I bet that scripture was a comfort. That word was a comfort to Moses because it must have been so difficult for him, mustn't it? To constantly go before Pharaoh and say, God's going to do this. Let my people go, says God. No. And then watch as this and that and the other, which were water turning to blood. Can you imagine the stench that would have come from the waters turning to blood? Frogs, gnats, flies, a plague on the livestock, oh, boils. Oh, I hate boils, do you? I can't bear anything, anything of spots I can't bear at all. You know, I really, really can't. Even my brothers, I had to get rid of all my brother's spots when he was a kid, you know. <laughs> can't bear spots. Hail. That was a bit of unnecessary information, wasn't it, really? <laughs> but I was just reminded. Hail, hailstones, massive hailstones. And then came the locusts and took all the crops. And then darkness, be massive darkness over the land. And lastly, the death of every firstborn, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And uh, which Moses foretold Pharaoh in Exodus 11. So we're all the way up to there now. But Pharaoh still hardened his heart. He sh you would have thought that he would have learned his lesson by now, wouldn't you? This was the 10th warning. And God had honored his previous nine warnings that what he said he would do. I think we can learn from that. But Pharaoh hardened his heart and he refused their exit visa, didn't he? Exodus 12, starting at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month. That's why St. Michael said it's the first month. The first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th, day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. 
If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them on that tenth day until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it in the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they will eat their lambs. That time, that same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So, having produced nine amazing miracles, God establishes that he's doing a new thing with the Israelites, doesn't he? That after 430 years in, in Egypt, this night, this night signifies a new month and a new year, a new beginning, a new start for the Hebrews. And they experience 10 miracles. And God ordains that on the 10th day of this new month, they are to choose the lamb of a sheep or a goat without defect. It's got to be perfect. And they, to make sure that the lamb is perfect, they're to inspect it and watch over it for five days until the 14th day when, if it passes inspection, at around 3 p.m., it would be brought to the doorstep of the home where it would be slaughtered and then cooked ready to eat at sundown. The blood of the lamb was to be collected in a bowl and then painted using a hyssop brush, a brush of hyssop, a twig of hyssop, onto the doorposts and the lintel of their houses, the doorstep of which was already covered in blood from the slaughter. Therefore, just for a moment, picture it. The entire entrance to this family's house was covered in blood, the blood of a lamb. Then the lamb was roasted whole over the fire. But for a whole lamb to cook within this time frame, it needed for the lamb to be placed on a spit, which was shaped like a crossbar. It was roasted in this way for three hours. Then the family entered through the blood-stained doorway into their home at sundown around 6 p.m., which is when the next Hebrew day began. And it was eaten together with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. And not one bone of the lamb was to be broken. We go to Exodus 12, verse 12. And God said to Moses, On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. 
and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And that night, God's angel came to Egypt, didn't he? He. And he inspected every home before entering it or, or bypassing it. If he saw the blood of the lamb on the door frame and doorposts, the angel passed over that house and went on to the house where there was no blood-stained doorway, where he then killed every firstborn of the family, including from their animals. It's quite a thing, isn't it, that God should do that? You know, for most humanists, naturists, Buddhists, and, 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 and people who have a faith that, that cannot imagine a God who would do something like that. And for us, it's a bit difficult, isn't it? We serve a God of love. And it, it takes a moment just to think, well, he did it in order to demonstrate who he was and to change the heart of somebody who held on to those he loved. It was actually an act which resulted in demonstrating his love. Verse 29. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was a loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. It was an awful event. And we know, all know that after this, the Hebrew people were finally released to go. And they went in haste, didn't they? And they plundered the Egyptians before they went, taking their gold and their precious valuables with them, which were given to them in order to say, go, go, go. We don't want anything more to do with you. We can see that God is on your side. And in what happened next, they all, every single man, woman, and child of the Israelites, experienced what for me is surely one of the greatest miracles ever recorded. The Red Sea rose up in high, towering walls, held back by the hand of God as Israel passed through into freedom. I wonder, I would, I, I would love to know what that was like. I would love to know what the, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of fire by day looked like, but I would love to know what it was like to see the water towering above them as they walked through on, on dry land. Da I think it was damp land, actually. <laughs> And I was thinking about, I, I know this, this is part of the Passover, but I was thinking about this again. And I was, I was struck by something that I, I hadn't particularly considered before. God did all this for his people Israel, didn't he? And I asked myself, was Israel a righteous people? Were they deserving of God to save them? Were they not moaning and complaining and resentful as most of humankind becomes when they're under pressure? Yes, they were sinners just as much as we were. And we still are. All fall short of the glory of God. Yet God loved them. God loved them so much that in his mercy he devised a way to rescue 
and save them from death, didn't he? He devised a way to open wide the gates of their prison and to set the captives free. They didn't deserve God's mercy any more than you and I did when he mercifully called us out of darkness and slavery into light. Verse 24, God had told the Israelites, obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. A lasting ordinance being something that never ends. Is that right? Never ends. Never ends. And Passover, Pesach, is to be remembered every year. Somewhere around 13, 14, 1500 years later, there's lots of, of guesses and estimates in the, in the commentaries. But somewhere 14, 1500 years later, Yeshua was born and appeared in Israel and grew up in a modest home with brothers and sisters. He became a carpenter. And together with his family, he celebrated the feast, didn't he? The feasts of God, according to the word. And the time I'm going to refer to is the time when together with his disciples, he made his way up, as they always did, to Jerusalem for Passover. But before reaching there, he stopped. And a few things happened, but one of the things he did was to instruct his disciples to locate the upper room where he could celebrate the Passover feast with them, that is, the meal. Now, they went off to do this, according to what he told them. And all the time, he knew what would happen to him, amen? Amen. He knew that he was going to go to Jerusalem and be betrayed, that he would die a sinner's death, a shameful death. And he knew that this Passover would be his last. We're going to go to Mark chapter 8. I love the clarity and simplicity of Mark's gospel. It's so clear and so concise. And verse 31 of chapter 8 says, He then began to teach them, his disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days would rise again. So he knew exactly what was in store for him. And he told the disciples also. But isn't it interesting that when we read this, the Gospels, they didn't get it. They didn't understand the things he was saying, even though we can see in hindsight, it was as clear as a bell what, what he was telling them. They didn't get it. We don't get it sometimes, do we? It takes a while for the, the percolation of the revelation to come through and we go, oh, that's what he meant. Oh, now I know. <laughs> I didn't get it. <laughs> Do you know that Yeshua arrived in Jerusalem on the 10th day of the first month? I love it. The day when the lambs were set apart for inspection. This is 1,400, 1,500 years later. He was observed for five days in full view of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. During that time, who questioned and challenged him, didn't they? They asked him everything they could think of to try and trip him up, to prove that he was someone 
that wasn't who he claimed to be. They wanted to find out if he was the Messiah. And why? Because he was the spotless lamb who was to be inspected before undergoing sacrifice. I love it. And the rulers and the authorities and even the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, could find no fault in him. But he had to die. And I think it helped me when I realized that he had agreed before the foundation of the earth with the Father that he would have to die. It was written that he would have to die as the once for all sacrifice for man. And in doing so, he would fulfill the Passover that Moses led the Israelites through. Yeshua, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, had to die in order to fulfill Passover. And so, Yeshua was crucified on the 14th day of the month, the day of the celebration of Pesach. Now, back in Egypt, the blood of the sacrificed lamb was painted on the home doorway of each sinful Israelite whom God led out of physical captivity into freedom. Remember that picture we had? And it was Yeshua's blood, Yeshua the sacrificed lamb, spread out upon the spit of the cross. It was his blood that flowed down the posts of the cross that paid the price for the sins of both Jew and Gentile so that both they and we could be led out of spiritual captivity into freedom. Up until this momentous event, the blood of the Lamb had only been able to cover man's sins, not take them away. Isaiah 53 spoke really prophetically of the human lamb who was to come, who would be led to slaughter, remember? And that he would be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, and the punishment that brought us peace would come upon him, Yeshua. When John the Baptist saw Yeshua at the beginning of his ministry, do you remember? He cried out prophetically, look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew, he understood that this was the one who would fulfill Isaiah's prophetic word and that he would take away the entire world's sin. And if the entire world would turn to Yeshua, then the entire world would know what it is to have the shame of sin taken away and to receive the peace that passes understanding. Remember that the Passover lamb was to be killed at three o'clock in the afternoon. On the 14th day, Yeshua was hung on the cross of crucifixion at nine o'clock in the morning on that day. Mark noted that it was the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. in Jewish time, when Yeshua breathed his last breath, six hours later. That's in Mark 15.33. For six hours, he lived whilst hanging on the cross in agony of body, soul, and spirit. And at noon, remember, 
deep darkness settled over the land. Deep darkness as the sun disappeared and Yeshua endured separation from God his Father. I've spoken before, and you can look it up on YouTube, about what happened on the cross as Yeshua died. And it makes me weep what he went through for mankind. He was roasted in the fires of hell. He received every fire of judgment known to man. He endured every grief and sorrow and pain, every sin that there is to be committed in this life. He endured on himself for you and for me. But the lamb was not to have a single bone to be broken. And so as the time came near for the high Sabbath, of Pesach, as it approached, in order to speed the deaths of those who were being crucified, the soldiers began to break their legs so that um, they had to die because they would no longer be able to breathe. And remember those who were crucified alongside Yeshua, they were thieves and murderers. Yeshua was already dead. He had given up his spirit to be in Father's hands. And not one bone of his body was broken. The entire lamb in Egypt was to be consumed and nothing left over for the next day. Yeshua's body was taken down before six o'clock, before that, that time when the next day would begin. And he was not left until the next day, was he? Simon came and took him. And it was finished and completed on the 14th day of the first month in accordance with God's word. The leaven had been removed. The world's sin had been taken away. Which brings us to the feast which starts at and immediately follows Pesach. The feast of unleavened bread. Now I can, I can be honest here and, and I can confess to you that I've never really fully understood the entire significance of this feast until now. Sometimes we just have to go over and over and over and over things and, and just, you know, go deeper and deeper, as I said at the beginning, in order to, to fully appreciate what it was that happened at that time that means that for us to, 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 to celebrate unleavened bread, is a r becomes a reality. It seemed to me to be a bit of a pointless exercise to have to eat bread without yeast full seven days in order to remember our sinfulness when the Lamb of God took away our sins in one day alone, the sins of the world, and said, it is done, it is finished. But, well tell you what I learned, that the Israelites were commanded to eat the roasted lamb along with the bitter herbs which spoke of sorrow and grief and hardship and bitterness. With the unleavened bread, which means bread made, baked without yeast or leaven. 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, 
as you really are. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, Yeshua, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, it's all about what he did and who we are as a result. That scripture demonstrates that leaven is a word that describes sin. And the whole point of unleavened bread at that first Passover was because there would not be time enough to make and prove and bake yeasted bread in the night flight from Egypt. They had to hurry. Remember, eat it in haste. And at midnight, the angel came of death came and there was not a single uh, 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 firstborn left. They had to disappear quickly. The author Richard Booker puts it succinctly, I think. Leaven became symbolic of the Hebrews' old life of bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh and the Egyptians' world system. Unleavened bread symbolized their putting off of this old life as they came out of Egypt. So they had... They had their meal, but the same night they took flight with unleavened bread because the symbol of Passover is that the sins are forgiven and they are taken away, fulfilled by Yeshua 1,500 years later. Now, nowadays, the Hebrew people go to great lengths to clear their homes of all the vestiges of leaven prior to Passover. There's a massive spring clean just in case there's a grain of leaven left in the house. And they celebrate freedom from the old life. Well, I want to remind you of a story in scripture which I know we all know so well. And it's a time when Yeshua was teaching and a huge crowd had followed him from town to town, and they were, they were avid for everything that he had to say. But there was a problem. They were hungry. And there was nothing for them to eat. And uh, Yeshua challenged the disciples, well, you feed them. You feed them. And the only found, food, found to be food, the only food to be found, was a derisible two small fish and five small barley loaves They're from a young boy. Now Yeshua took this meager offering, didn't he? And he blessed it. And before their eyes, it multiplied so that it fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Just picture that in your mind's eye for a moment. I would imagine that those five fish, fi two fish and five loaves would not even fill that space. And yet the power of God multiplied it as it was being given out. It's like it just never ended. It never ended. The fish, yeah, you can have some. Yes, you can have some. And probably 8,000 people were fed amazing picture. Did Yeshua do this simply because they were hungry? No. As always, he did everything to bring revelation of who he was and what he offers to mankind. If we would only have eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand. And the next morning, Yeshua spoke to the crowds about that bread that they had eaten the previous day. And his disciple, John, was a witness. I'm going to read from John 6, starting at verse 26. Yeshua answered, Very truly, I tell you, 
You are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. <coughs> then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Yeshua answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Yeshua said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world sir they said always give us this bread and then Yeshua declared in those immortal words I am the bread of life Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes in me will never be thirsty. You know what? They didn't like his words. They didn't like him, and they murmured against him. But Yeshua did not back down from his claim, did he? That he is the unleavened bread from God, sent down from heaven in the flesh. He repeated it again, driving the point home. I am the bread of life, verse 48. Your ancestors at the manor in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. More arguing, more contention, more murmuring. And then Yeshua presses in again for the third time. Verse 53, Yeshua said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. You have no life in you. Whoever eats my, my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day, for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. It's all about eternal life, isn't it? It's eternal life. It's not about this life and what we can get in this life. It's eternal life. And I find continually in recent months, I talk about, I speak about, I preach about eternal life. The feast of unleavened bread is to remind us that we as believers are now dead to sin and alive to eternity. Hallelujah! <laughs> and to help remind us we have the Lord's instructions to remember him from 1 Corinthians 11. 
the Lord Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. This is the night of Passover, the night when he broke bread with his disciples. And he knew he was going to be betrayed. And he said, when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after that supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. 